It's all different times. There's no way you can really compare it, except the addiction, I think, is still the same on yo-yos. You can argue all you want, but Duncan has been the mainstay of yo-yos uh, uh, since the late 20s. Even those days, though, it was, that was expensive, but we found a way to get that money and play that yo-yo. Um, idle, idle mind is the devil's workshop. Idle hands are the devil's tools. So keep those hands busy, and a yo-yo is a great way to do it. So the yo-yo has been dated back to 500 BC, where people have found vases with pictures depicting people playing yo-yos on them, and it is the second oldest toy next to the doll. Yo-yoing, of course, is, is a, a great developer of eye-hand coordination. It enhances their catching skills, uh, and tracking is very important, sequencing is very important. The, the yo-yos have been around for a long time. I mean, we can definitely trace them back to the to being very popular even in the 1790s over in France and England. And, and what really started what I would consider the modern yo-yo era uh, is when Pedro Flores came over and uh, started selling yo-yos. And he, the thing that he did was he named them yo-yos, which is uh, it's a curious name, yo-yo. And even though it had been called that for hundreds of years in Phil the Philippines, uh, it was new to America, and so that was kind of a very cool um, name to apply the toy. And sometimes you just need that to get it to have that sticking quality. It, and I remember reading one article, a real early article in the, either the late 20s or early, early 30s about yo-yos. They say, we all know what it is, but we never knew what to call it. When Donald Duncan met Pedro Flores and saw what he was doing with the yo-yo, he instantly knew that it was something that he wanted to be a part of and wanted to grow in advance. And I, I believe it grew much larger than Donald Duncan could have ever imagined. The, the history of Duncan is really an incredible history, how, how dominant it has been and how dominant it still remains. And, and yes, they are vital to uh, uh, keeping the yo-yo movement going. He was a marketing genius. And what he did was, and this was in the very, very early 30s, uh, William Randolph Hearst controlled the majority of newspapers in the United States, and Duncan went in and said, listen, I have an idea for increasing your subscriptions to your newspapers. And so what Duncan proposed was, uh, in the newspapers, they have a lot of white space where they just don't have enough stuff to fill the newspaper, so they just throw in the you know, gimmicky articles about something just to fill it. He says, you give me the white space to advertise my yo-yo contest, and what we'll do is we'll say to enter the yo-yo contest, the person that enters has to sell two to three subscriptions to your newspaper. And the, the one kid that actually had money was the newspaper boys. And here was the newspaper running the contest, and there were big prizes involved, and Hearst gave Duncan uh, sh Chicago. Well, in a six-week period, they sold 50,000 new subscriptions to that newspaper. And Hearst says, that's it. This is, this is a brilliant idea. You've got all my newspapers. And so that just gave Duncan market dominance over everybody else. And, and from that point on, Duncan has, of course, uh, pretty much dominated uh, the yo-yo the industry. When Duncan first started sending out demonstrators, uh, the country was in the middle of the Great Depression. So something like this is exactly what the country needed. I mean, it gave hope to both the demonstrators but also the people who were watching. At the recommendation of Pedro Flores, um, a lot of the demonstrators that were brought in during that time were Filipinos, mostly because they were already trained, having done the same sort of promotions for Flores before uh, you know, it was acquired by Duncan. Uh, that started the, uh, that dynasty, the Duncan dynasty. Although Duncan made his own yo-yos before Flores, I think Flores really kind of uh, taught Don Duncan how to market it through uh, the contest. Duncan Sr. brought over all of these 77 demonstrators. If they would work for him for seven years, he would put them through college, as much college as they wanted. Bob Rolla took that opportunity and became a PhD and was a very successful individual. But it was all funded by Duncan's offer. 
Well, in 1978, a filmmaker by the name of John Melvin Bishop did a little film on, uh, on one of the original demonstrators named Nemo Concepcion. But the greatest thing that saved me is the Don Yoyo. In 1932, I met Pedro and he said, come here, you look like uh, a gentleman, you're dressed up all the time, and you must be something all right, he said, so come with me. So he brought me to the Duncan office, but the manager did not qualify me yet, because you have to do plenty of tricks to be a demonstrator. I will come back in two weeks, I said. I went to practice in my room, day and night, day and night, day and night. So I went there in two weeks. Well, I'll show you everything now, I said. The manager said, oh, we sign you up now, you are all right. <laughs> and being a demonstrator in, in that time period was a big deal. I mean, these guys wore three-peat suits and, uh, and they, they uh, you know, they ate at nice diners. And, and, and also another interesting thing culturally was when the Filipinos would go into a town, they would uh, a lot of times set up a, uh, a talk at the local library about their native country. Because you got to remember, this was uh, the early 20, uh, late 20s, early 30s. People were fascinated by the Philippine Islands. They were fascinated by older cultures because, you know, you go to Nebraska, I mean, everybody's the same there. And here's this guy with dark skin and from an island that's speaking with an accent and, and he's playing this toy that nobody's ever seen before and the kids are fascinated by it. Now this is the elevator of the Empire State Building. Down and up. Yeah. <laughs> But it's just interesting because who are these Filipino guys, you know, who could just do this thing? It was almost kind of like, it was just kind of exciting because they were so great at it and they had the moves. It becomes almost like martial arts in a funny way. Some of the moves are really uh, dramatic. We would even uh, ride our bicycles from one contest to another contest that was scheduled an hour or two hours later to make sure we got all the patches. And, uh, all the, all the prizes we could. So it was interesting stuff. So they, they used a lot of marketing skills to really bring the attention level up. One of the things we take for granted today is the yo-yo setup. I mean, basically you get it out of the package and you're done today. But back then, they actually did a lot of work to get their yo-yo set up to play right. Okay, when you bought a yo-yo, a brand new yo-yo, this is the tournament, the Wood Day Maple Yo-Yo. Now, the thing of it is, they were not finished, They're, they were not smooth. There was all rough wood in there. And so it was like, um, so you would take some fine sandpaper and sandpaper the inside so it would be a smooth surface. You had to make sure you didn't touch the axle because if you touch the axle, you could mess it up and it would break strings on you. So you'd smooth that. I, I would, I would uh, sand the yo-yo on the inside, smooth it out. Use, I'd always use a little wax on my string. Or you could put a little graphite in there. It would spin longer. And then you'd play the yo-yo for a while. And then you'd redo it, re-sand it, a finer sandpaper. Then we used to take a knife and scrape the outside, not the outside, the inside grooves to a V-shape and then slew with them smooth. This way, when you did tricks like men and flying trapeze and string tricks, easier to catch and you'd have a smooth working yo-yo. You know, you keep one for the left hand, one for the right hand when you do, do, do loops because that yo-yo is broke in for your left hand. That means there's a, there must be a tiny groove on the left hand side of that axle to keep that slant. You want that slant. And like I said, you can, when it's right, you can just feel it. You can just feel it, how smooth it is. And then they'd always tell you, oh, you got a trick yo-yo. That's a sure do. I said, there's a turn right in there. He's inside the wooden yo-yo. And it spins around, spins around. And when it stops, it gets tired, I give him the yo-yo to eat. And that's why my yo-yo spins a long time. Well, heading into the 1950s, things really started to pick up for Duncan. And so they started recruiting a lot of the younger players. And a lot of the younger players that they brought in were actually Duncan champions. And uh, the first year, I didn't win anything. 
The second year, I started playing and I got better and better. And uh, I, I didn't win a championship that year either because the day of the last entrance contest, I caught the flu. And I was sick and my buddies and friends that came by my house, Ken, we're going to the contest, you're going. And I said, no, nope, I can't, I'm just too sick. And uh, I had talked to the kids after the contest and they, they said, man, they couldn't even do Rock the Baby. I said, oh gee, I would have won that contest too. <laughs> so, but then the next year, I won the contest and I won the Yo-Yo Championship of Detroit. And that was the first brand new bike I ever had. <laughs> that uh, Richard Mackinac, he and I worked together. And the, today was the first time I saw him in 57 years. Yeah, yeah, and um, he was a very good player. You could tell who was a good yo-yo player by looking at his yo-yo because they did a lot of walk the dogs, a lot of creepers and so forth. Rick Mashinak is the only one who entered contest, and I hated to see him come because he was so good. <laughs> but by the time 49 rolled around, I was running twin bicycles, and they were sending me here and sending me there. And I think I won five or six of them in a row, and I said, you know, you really can't win any more of them. you got to let somebody else win them. So I did. you got to let the little kids win sometimes or they won't play anymore. <laughs> And then Steve Moy was right here now when I was running contests for Duncan. Uh, we did them through the park department. We had borough contests, and then the winners from all the boroughs came to Central Park, and Steve was our winner. And we got this really huge trophy. It was like about, oh, three foot tall, and it had yo-yos on the side, and it was, it was really, really an awesome trophy. And it had a, you know, a, a plate on it in front of it said, New York City Parks and Recreation, Duncan Yo-Yo Champion, 1964. And I was so proud of that. And plus we won a hundred bucks too. And I, my father actually gave me a yo-yo when I was nine and taught me how to do walk the dog and rock the baby. But I uh, didn't get the fever until I saw a uh, Duncan demonstrator, uh, Wayne Lundberg in Kansas City, Missouri. I got in and started getting into the contest. And of course I was one of the kids, you know, that followed the Duncan yo-yo man around. So I was going to maybe six or seven contests a week. And then in 55, I was 15. So it was gonna be my, it was gonna be my last year, of course, cause uh, Duncan at that time, uh, 15 years old was the, was the limit. And uh, I walked in and was gonna enter the contest and Wayne says, well, <clears throat> would you like to do that for money instead of prizes? I said, well, that sounds, that sounds good. So I drew my first paycheck from Duncan Yo-Yo in 1955. Then after the contest was over, and I was lucky enough to come in first in one of the districts, and then I don't know, out of a clear blue sky, they asked me, how would you like to travel and sell Yo-Yos? Well, holy mackerel, I hadn't been out of the city limits, let alone any place else, you know. So. I went right home and boy, I told my mother all about it. She said, no, you can't leave home. My dad said, don't stop now, let him go. I think if you were an American boy uh, you, and, and were a yo-yo demonstrator, you probably came under the tutelage of uh, Barney Akers. Yeah, Barney asked if, if we wanted to work part-time. And that's how I first started with Duncan. Probably 54, 1954. Um, he was real good with the kids, but he was strict. He, uh, he didn't uh, uh, put up with any nonsense. He, he demanded such respect for not only the demonstrators, but also the parents and the kids and the wholesalers. And he was just a very rare individual. More rare than anybody else in the group. Kids would get out of line and, you know, when you throw it out and reverse it, yeah, he, he would, he'd pop a kid right on top of the head. <laughs> yeah, get back in line. <laughs> uh, it's hard to explain his character. He was short and always had that, that little hat on. And of course he had nicknames for all of us, some of them which I couldn't repeat. He called me Little Peckerhead. <laughs> I don't know what it means. But, and he would refer later on as I got to know him better. I, would, I had this little Peckerhead and, and uh, 
Salt Lake City. And, or, and so that was just a nickname that he had given, I guess, little kids that he remembered. But he'd talk about little pucker heads here and here and here, and there was nothing, nothing mean or dirty about it. It was just the name. And he said he was in a group of young children, and he uh, walked up to this one little boy, a little freckle-faced boy, he said, and he asked him, what kind of yo-yo you got there? And the little boy said, a Duncan, what else? <laughs> but uh, he was quite a character. Tre tremendous yo-yo player. And we always knew it was Barney when we saw the West Virginia license plate. He was Huntington, West Virginia. And uh, I said, well, where's your yo-yo contest today? He saw him over here. And I says, oh, you got no yo-yo sign in the window. He says, no, I don't. He says, no yo-yo sign. How's he going to get kids here? Sure enough, when it came time for that contest, there were hundreds of kids all over the place. He was a Pied Piper. And uh, he was a compliment to the yo-yo. Here's world champion Barney Akers. Thank you. You know, I've been all around the world performing these yo-yo tricks for the past 40 years. And I've always tried my best to uh, teach anyone how they can do these tricks. But he says, uh, well, let's see you do that around the corner and catch it when it comes over your arm. And uh, so I practiced and practiced. I says, Barney, show me how to do that. I said, I can't get it. You know, I can't. And he laughed. He says, can't do it. It's impossible. <laughs> and I said, yeah. ah. So I went back and started practicing again. <laughs> Next time I saw Barney, I said, Barney, look at this. Guy. Snap. Needleson says, let me see you do that again. <laughs> so, but I learned how to do it. <laughs> So I got one up on Barney Acres. That's, you didn't often do that. <laughs> it, it's neat being in kind of a position like um, uh, Dale Oliver because you talk about the degrees of bacon. Well, <laughs> everybody is a degree of Dale Oliver away in the yo-yo community, I think, because so-and-so was so-and-so and they were trained by Dale Oliver. And, well, but no, I was trained by so-and-so. Yeah, but did you know his person that trained him was trained by Dale Oliver? So it keeps always going back. And you, you go back and then it's like, then it's Barney Acres and you go back further and it's, you know, so we're all this giant big pyramid. Like Dale Oliver is just, the, the contribution he's made to the yo-yo and is immeasurable. Like to think about the number, not just the number of times he's been world champion, but the number of world champions that were directly influenced by him or trained by him outright. I think he was a, one of the best uh, during that era as far as um, for everything, really, you know? and he was uh, he was uh, he was uh, my uh, my mentor, really. He and he's still he's still going strong. He still. Lupe was a very good man. He's uh, you could depend on him. To when he worked in the area, it would be worked correctly. He worked for Dale, and Dale taught him a whole bunch of new tricks, and he was all set to learn it. And. Loopy invented a trick where you do loop to loop and you knock the yo -yo, uh, the, a coin off your own ear. Trying to invent n new tricks, just even if they were simple, they were new. But they were simple and they were unique, yeah, as, as far as, you know, doing something with a string, whether it's the, the Puerto Rican flag, or the rebel flag, or the American flag. And, and if you can see the American flag, you pop yourself in the head and see the stars and stuff like that. Just chip it on, you know. And uh, one of them, the, probably the biggest character of that 60s era, early 60s, was a fellow named Skeeter Beebe. And he could, he could just barely do the eight tricks. But if you went into a town behind him, you would never convince the kids that he wasn't the world's greatest. Skeeter was really a character. He would get himself into places that you never thought you could get the yo-yo in. I mean, he, he, you know, I don't know, you know, how he, he did it, but he would, he, he had a lot of brash nerve and he, and he wasn't that good with the yo-yo. He, he was good at talking. And it's hard to believe that a demonstrator really only knew three yo-yo tricks. But he said, he did them with such style and that's all you really need to do. Because really demonstrating isn't really, in those years, 
was more about running the contest and organization and getting the kids hyped up. It wasn't about how skilled you were with the yo-yo tricks. Um, you needed to be able to teach a kid how to do a sleeper, do around the world, rock the baby, you know, uh, walk the dog. Beyond that, that's the large majority of all the tricks the kids knew. So uh, a lot of the demonstration, uh, although yo-yo demonstrators were all mostly really good players because they loved the yo-yo, really demonstration is just a lot of hard work. Well, I know I've done a few demos where, where some of the old demonstrators would actually come and watch. And you know, after the demos, you, st you stand around and you start teaching kids. But it's something about being a demonstrator that never goes away. I mean, some of these guys, they jump right in and they start teaching kids like they had never stopped. And he's got just this light in his eyes as he's talking to the eight-year-old. And, and you know, he's shown that kid how to put a yo-yo, you know, the, the loop on his finger and how to wind the yo-yo. And he's done that 10,000 times before. And you're watching that demonstrator. And it's like he's telling the first kid for the very first time how to do it. But it's, and, and they're just looking at you like, this is the coolest thing I've ever done in my entire life. And, and so I, I think that's, pervasive through all demonstrators. If you can't do that, if you don't love kids, and if you don't love passing that heritage on, you'll never be a great demonstrator, no how, matter how good you are uh, with the yo-yo. If you had a group of kids, they, they would see it and see what could be done. They were fascinated with it. And it, would, it if you, and then if you could have had enough time to teach them how to do the spinner, you had them, you had them hooked, because then you could show them a, a, a pamphlet on how to do the tricks because they had to learn to do the spinner and how to adjust the string. And that was the most important thing. When you had a good kid, you tried to make him better because you knew he was going to be showing other kids how to do it. They weren't, they, there was no uh, competition to teaching someone. If you know how to do a trick, you teach somebody else how to do a trick. The kids were, became the champions and some of them went a long way, got jobs with Duncan. Um, that Bobby Rule, he, he was in my class. And after he, wa he wanted to travel in the worst way and took him in to, uh, to the boss and t let him talk to the boss and he was in the, and he turned out to be a wonderful demonstrator, yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Yo-Yo. Uh, Bob Rule, Robert Rule, fantastic player, uh, one of the best I've ever seen. Bob Rule, we would drive to his school, pick him up when he got out of school, and we'd drop him off at various yo yo uh, We'd have various yo-yo contests scheduled for him. And he was dependable. And he, he was one of the old yo-yo champions from Detroit. And uh, Barney would set me up contest uh, and that's, that's how I got started at Kresge stores, which are a thing of the past now. If there was ever anything special that needed to be done in the New York area, Tom Parks was, uh, was the one that would do it. And you didn't have to question how he would do it, he would just do it. Barney asked me if I wanted to work, and I told him I would. And uh, he had three 1955 Plymouths. They were red, white, and blue, and they had Donald F. Duncan decals on the doors. This, this is how we traveled. This is a, a 1955 Buick Special. And I think, I think everyone, in, all the gang of us had one and we all had those labeled uh, on the side of it, which was terrible because it tied you up. <laughs> <laughs> so when you drove into a city or a town, it was very impressive to see how people glared and stared at the car when you came in with a yo-yo on the side of the car. And Well, if a city or a market is big enough, then it took more than one to be in the city. Like Chicago took four, Los Angeles took four, Dallas took two. So uh, six, six days a week, um, and we would run a promotion for eight weeks. So we moved every eight weeks. Probably 10, 11 months a year we worked. Back and forth was from coast to coast. So it was our job to go in, find a school, and then start driving around it to find. Back then, there was a lot of little confectionery stores literally across the street from every school. There was a little mom and pop confectionery store, and those were hot spots. And we would go in there and introduce ourselves uh, 
ask about the contest. You know, we had our own, we made our own little schedule. And we would go in and we called it play in the schools. You had to go play the schools for, for your contest that day. Well, when the kids, during noon, the kids would get out on the playground. And so we would go right up to a school and we would walk out onto the playground, you know, doing two-handed loops and, you know, all the kids at the playground would immediately converge, you know, yay, converge us around us and immediately the teachers would run into the school to call the police. And <laughs> Fortunately, 99% of the time you were okayed. So we put on a, a demonstration and invite the kids then after school. We're going to be down at the candy store at four o'clock. And now what we want you to do is when you can get a yo-yo, get your yo-yo and bring it up. We're going to show you how to do all the tricks. And when we get you to know how to do the tricks, then we're going to have a championship contest. So we give the kids our message and, and, and I t you know, take a yo-yo and do a skyrocket with a yo-yo going out there. So all the kids would turn around and run after the yo-yo and I would turn around and walk off the playground to leave before the cops got there. So. <laughs> and Barney said to me one day, he says, hmm, I went out on this pretty I threw out my yo-yos and I had a big crowd around me and then I could see in the distance someone walking towards me and I knew it was a teacher. And finally, I told the kids where the contests were and so forth. Then the teachers came up to me and said, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm telling the kids about the yo-yo contest. You're not supposed to be here. And he, she says, what is your name? And he says, um, Ufahem McGeefus. Ufahem McGeefus. How do you spell that? I'm going to write down and report to you. And Barney said he was thinking, I said, I don't know how to spell it either. <laughs> but you learned how to get on and get off in a hurry before the police got there or the, the teacher in charge came out. And, but if you got run off to school by that mean old so-and-so who ran a yo-yo man off, that your contest was that much more popular that night. But can you imagine going onto a playground today? I mean, they'd have you in jail for two or three days investigating you. So that went by the wayside. The contests were slow at first, and they grew week after week, and the kids learned how to yo-yo. And as more kids learned to yo-yo, more kids on the school ground wanted to play yo-yo too. And pretty soon there was a fad, and sometimes the school would ban yo-yos and so forth, but you ban a product and the kids want it more. <laughs> it's just the way things are. In Wichita, Kansas one year, uh, I was running a yo-yo contest on the sidewalk and they came along and the police interrupted me and arrested me. Well, the judge said, we are getting tired of playing cops and robbers with you because every time we get a call from a school, we run out and try to see what's going on and you've already left. So here's the deal. Every time we catch you on public property, we're going to arrest you and every time the fine will be bigger. So from that on, from then on in, in Wichita, why we made sure we were doing things on private property. <laughs> and, and then I can remember too, it, it became known that if, if you were lucky or if you got a, through a certain number of tricks, that you would get free strings. And they had a way of just grabbing one out, you know, whip that thing out and had one of this guy and whip one out. So if you got a string, you were, but getting that string was, uh, you know, you got something. You had to do something to get that string. I've got my ball of string from Luck, Wisconsin. Barney gave me that. When I was working, I was working, but, and you had to make my own strings. Barney did too. Most all of us did. We made our own strings every night, so. We'd go there early in the morning because on the windowsills all around, there would be yo-yo strings. They would put new yo-yo strings and take the old string off their yo-yo, lay them on the, uh, and we'd collect those because they were still good. And uh, yo-yo string was very prized in those days. And so it seemed to me like there was always the kids who could figure out a way to get that, that back window open or something and reach in there and, and, and get a bunch of strings. I mean, <laughs> so, where'd you get the strings? Oh man, out of the back of the car, man, what do you think? You know, you keep, keep, keep the Filipino cat busy while we go, you know, the back of the car. 
Oh God, it just never ends, I guess. <laughs> and we used to have these uh, preliminary contests. You would have a, a local parks contest. Those contests were, of course, you know, like neighborhood contests. You know, and we'd, we'd take the name of the winner and then we'd invite the winner to, to come to the citywide or the, or the area-wide contest. Uh, Just going around to local candy stores, you would hear somebody would say, hey, they're having a yo-yo contest down on 34th Street. So you go down here and then a couple days later, they'll be up on 41st Street to the candy stores. And then the local movie theater used to have a contest on Saturdays where you go up there and have contests for looping it. You see, they would eliminate with different tricks, but the, the way they would get the winners were whoever could do loop de loop the most. You know. Patches I got, you know, uh, uh, I guess the, the 10 or 12, the average. I mean, I haven't looked at all those in a while, but then later on, if you uh, somehow became one notch up or, or several, then you got a patch called the Junior Instructor, which I have. And I can't even remember what the heck I had to do for that one, but I guess you hung around enough, you showed up every week, they kind of started recognizing you, and uh, you worked your way up the, up the crowd and then would become a demonstrator. <laughs> I gave up too soon. Now, a swim bike in my day was like having owning a car because not every kid had a bike. You just, you know, or you had a used bike and you had a, a swim bike. Everybody said, hey, he's got a swim. That was like having the Cadillac of bikes. And that was the first prize, and was for a long time. Yeah, Schwinn Bicycle was the biggest thing we gave away. And that was at the, they called it the city championships. But they would have like seven city championships. That'd be one of them. It was more of a little district than it was a city. But they call it the city championship. I mean, as everybody knows, there's always somebody who's better than you right around the corner, you know, and to learn that the hard way, you know, I'm the best at this or best at that. And next thing you know, here comes a guy from the other side of town, another, the other high school, I mean, the other grade school or whatever, who could just do all this stuff. He must have been the only kid that stayed home longer than I did practice, and I don't know. Sometimes the, be the best player didn't, didn't actually win. You can get nervous and miss a trick, and somebody can, and you could do like, a gazillion tricks, but it didn't matter because unless you got those ten basics down, and you you know it was it was, it was structured like that. And the contests were always fun, and the uh, everybody was always congenial. There were never fights or things like that. You know, it was a friendly competition, but definitely a competition. The first national champion was a fellow named Richard Woodward from Memphis, Tennessee. He took his five thousand dollar check and invested it in Holiday Inn stock. And then, of course, Jimmy Lucas uh, won in 63. I mean, television was, was massive. Um, it's like the internet is now. I mean, it just, it, it was a, it was a society changing type of invention. And uh, the demonstrators uh, fed upon that. But at the same time, we, uh, they started going through, probably around 1963, one of the biggest, most massive yo-yo crazes the country had ever had because they started direct marketing on TV. It wasn't just going in and uh, just hitting those uh, stations which would put you on for free. They were buying ad time. And uh, I believe it was Nashville, they saw, sold more yo-yos in their, their little uh, promotion in Nashville than there were people that lived in Nashville at the time. It was, it was incredible. When television came out, instead of anywhere from 7 to 20 or 30 kids uh, showing up at a contest spot, when it was advertised on television, there were sometimes it would be uh, over a thousand. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't really walk around, you know, without, you know, having a bunch of kids, try the kids dancing around me, you know, yo, 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 yo. <laughs> We demonstrate all over, including uh, even sometimes nightclubs and stuff. We, we walked all, in any, any place we could, you know, uh, throw a yo-yo out there, man. We were, we were there and, uh, and we were having a lot of fun with it. Uh, the crowds, you wouldn't believe. We would have to have uh, 
for a contest, we'd have to have police escorts to uh, get the crowd back enough so that we could get a contest going because the people, everybody wanted to be, you know, right at the center of attraction. So they'd come with their uh, clubs and hold the crowd back while the kids were doing their contests. And then if, for, for us to put on a show, we had to get up on the marquee of the theater that we're at or at the hotel we we're staying at and do the yo-yo tricks off, off the ground because it was just impossible to try anything. The crowds were just crazy. Yo-yo mania. Yeah, yo-yo mania they called it. The, even the, the police and the priests and, and you'd see them going down the street playing yo-yo. <laughs> It was fun. It was, it was unreal. I was driving to a, to a contest spot and I couldn't, I couldn't get close. I mean, the traffic was too bad. And so I had to park, I had to walk like two blocks. And when I got there, there was one of these strip mall shopping centers. And the parking lot was full of, not cars, but people. The parking lot was full of people. They were waiting for me. I mean, there was probably close to 2,000 people there. Just a regular, you know, contest appearance. Uh, just thousands and thousands of kids in contests. And we gave away some great prizes. And, uh, and I hope we generated a lot of talent. I, we saw a lot of kids uh, develop just as we had developed. And it was good to see that. I, one time I was overwhelmed at a shopping center the cops didn't want me to get out of the car. That happened in the city too with the park department. There was a, a playground in Bedford Stuyvesant that there were just too many kids. I had the park department car and driver and they just said keep going. They, they didn't want that big a crowd. Um, Clyde Mortensen visited a couple of my spots where I had like 200 kids you know all in the parking lot. You know, I had, it was, they used to go crazy in a while, you know. I need some kind of staging. I says, I have to get above this crowd. I says, you know, nobody's going to see me. And they says, well, all we have is one of these rolling carts. So they wheeled this thing out <laughs> into the middle of this parking lot. And I got up there and, you know, things were kind of shaky. But I said, oh, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do this. So I got to the end and I did skyrocket to the pocket. Well, one night Yo-Yo went up, the crowd went, boom! <laughs> because they were trying to catch the yo-yo. And of course, they knocked the thing that I was standing on, they knocked it down and, you know, like I was doing a mosh pit, you know, <laughs> back then, but I survived, so. Moving into the 70s, there were actually, there were still were Duncan demonstrators around, um, but it kind of didn't last long. Yo-yos went well until the 70s, when inflation took over, it was just, you couldn't advertise on television. Man, the price of television was too much, so television was gone. There were no schools being played. And uh, the, the, the oil business went downhill. Then all the demonstrators were discharged. There was no way you could run promotions as before because the cost of travel, places to live, uh, it was just too expensive. Everything was too expensive. Uh, there's this theory that if you want to make something really, really cool or cooler than it already is, uh, you just have to put it on wheels. The roller skating demonstrations in the 70s was pretty cool because you had roller skates and yo-yos together and it's two things that people love as a toy and as a, as a skill. And so when you put the two together, it was crazy. The Duncan roller skating thing was the best. That was one of the coolest things ever to happen, probably. Not just with Duncan, I mean ever. In the history of anything. Sliced bread is probably not even a close second. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just picturing, I'm just thinking about the pictures of the guys all together. It's a very eclectic mix of baton twirlers and roller skaters, and they're all yo-yoing. And During the time of those roller skating promotions, uh, there was a guy named Frankie Smith that actually had a hit song called Yo-Yo Champ. Call me the Yo-Yo Champ, I'm Mr. 
Things kind of plotted along, plot along, and you started seeing some contests resurging, like the uh, California State Championships and this sort of thing. And then, um, and then once the contest scene started coming back, then you started getting the innovation coming back again into the yo-yos. If we didn't have like the Nationals and the World Yo-Yo Championships, I, I don't think that the yo-yo would be in certainly the place it is. And that's something that certainly needs to be preserved. Uh, is the contest, because that's what brings people into the fold, that competition and that fellowship from those contests. So around about 97, 1997 or so, is when the, the popularizing of the transaxle really came into play. And the, it increased spin times from about 45 seconds to a few minutes. Uh, and it was right about that time where the two longest standing members of Duncan actually started working for Duncan. I actually started with Duncan in 1999, which is before the Duncan crew technically existed. Uh, Fiend Magazine was putting yo-yos on the Vans Warped Tour, and each company had a guy, and I was Duncan's guy on the tour. So I was, I guess, the second person technically uh, on Duncan crew, because Hank Freeman would be the first, since he was actually doing commercials for Duncan before me. The so. uh, commercial was in, I think, 99 or 90. Yeah, I think it was 99. And we did the transaction commercial, and I got to do that. Keep spinning on and on. You must whip it. The new high performance transaction yo yo from Duncan spins three times longer than other yo yos for three times the action and three times the rush. So whip it! A lot of the older yo yo players didn't embrace the idea of a transaxle yo yo as being a, a proper competitive yo yo. Uh, but at the time, kids didn't care, and that was the beauty of it. Because kids didn't care, and they were using this new technology, they really used that to, to push innovation forward. And so from about 1999 to 2001, the innovation was off the charts. Kids were coming up with things unimaginable before. It's that innovation and that uh, those the new ball bearing transaxle yo-yos and all that. That's what what is driving the market now, and that's what gets people involved and interested in the sport. So yo-yo play has changed dramatically from when the demonstrators first did tricks of the up and down loop to loop sleeper tricks. And the RV tour in 1999 was really the, the first tour Duncan ever did, showcasing sort of this new style of yo-yo play. Uh, Duncan offered me a job, and I started working for them. I, uh, uh, well, I, I was in an RV and they, they, uh, they started me in New Jersey and I went from New Jersey to Los Angeles uh, doing store demonstrations, school assemblies all along the way uh, and that was a blast. Well, Chris Neff is always fun to watch. I mean, he has such a unique, smooth style. And probably the coolest thing to never take off in yo-yoing is uh, something Neff came up with while on the RV tour called the Apparatus. So anyway, I made the apparatus while in the RV. Yeah, I, I, I would drill holes and whatever, and I'm just trying to make two fingers that I control, that I could control how far apart they were from each other and control the pitch of one so that I could do just the, the tricks that already existed on that. And that was inspired by, you know, trying to do stuff like a skateboard video, you know, where you're, you know, you're yo-yoing on the environment, well, you'd be skateboarding on the environment, the urban environment. Same thing, we'd done some stuff like yo-yoing on a bicycle rack or whatever. So I was trying to make that portable. And uh, it, uh, the first trick that I came up with, it, I mean, I did some mounts and stuff, was standing back from it about eight feet, and then you just throw the whole thing at it, and then boom, and it's just sitting there. But somebody I met on the RV tour said, uh, you know, was just visiting me in the RV, and, then, and I'm like, I gotta show you this. And I pulled out in the parking lot, and I landed the first time, and they were just jaw dropped. I mean, I've never seen somebody actually jaw dropped. But I know that, that I am very impressed with the current pros. I think they're pretty neat guys. I think that they've uh, more than replaced the shoes that were left behind. And by the year 2000, all these innovations came into play and, and those, those tricks that were sort of just novelties had grown and matured into their own styles. And I think it was this, this culmination of all these tricks to, that really prompted Duncan to bring back a, a proper professional team. Well, when the Duncan crew first started, instead of getting players that weren't necessarily the most competitive, they put together a group of people that had awesome personalities and very original styles and tricks and just in the way they lived their life. 
So it was just a, a much different group of people. You know, everybody on the crew kind of sticks out for their own individual characteristics, as where other teams just kind of blend together as just straight competitive teams. You have artists, musicians, graphic designers, filmmakers. People don't even have any idea what a spiritually wealthy group of people these are. Each guy that's wearing that shirt seems to fit in some kind of mold. Well, each one of them seems to have just such a strong, well-founded uh, just presence about them. People that were brought on were brought on for their passion and for their involvement in the community, whether it was running contests, developing new tricks, new ideas, and new ways to actually run a contest, and just innovating the whole yo-yo scene. I've seen uh, the Duncan crew grow uh, from its uh, early days to just a, uh, a group of guys, a small group of guys from all over the America to uh, one of the largest uh, worldwide crews. Another thing I love about the Duncan crew is that it has some of the yo-yo community's best video editors. We've got Bride, Takeshi, Glass Eye, uh, Citadel, Gabriel Lozano, all these guys that have made these videos for people throughout the years and everybody has watched and fell in love with. Duncan Crew is my family, family total. Só camarada, só. É isso, Duncan Crew is é nice. Being part of Duncan Crew meant that I was becoming part of something that was bigger than myself as part of a community and that it, I would have opportunities to really contribute to a community that I really cared about. It meant that I could really push forward promoting it with help and support and also help and support pushing it forward. It's a, it's a really symbiotic relationship. The Duncan Crew Mundial, they all know each other, they all know each other very well. Son muy chistosos y creo que en todo el mundo los conocen. No hay algún país que no conozca a Duncan Crew y es increíble cómo se llevan todos. I think our biggest contribution as a crew is community building. Like I don't know that there's any other sponsored group for any activity in the rest of the world who does what we do. We really are we're the rock that that the entire community is built on. Kakoi they're just extremely cordial persons that uh, that need to have a Duncan Yo-Yo in their hand inspiring other people to play. It was that passion and motivation to contribute to the scene, regardless of whether you would get sponsored or not, that, that really got a lot of those guys noticed and invited to the crew in the first place. Yeah. The first Yo-Yo I ever saw was actually at Takeshi. I saw a video of him and I knew it was a yo-yo, but other than that I was kind of like, wow, I don't know what's happening, but it's something I want to figure out. But there's that mentor or uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, young Luke Skywalker uh, relationship with yo-yos. And I think the people that stay in the sport have that relationship with somebody. They're, they're always respected wherever they go and, and you got to earn that stuff. Ah, Duncan Crew Worldwide, I love you guys. And the, the, the tricks, of course, have gotten insane. It's kind of like, I guess you could say it's like, you know, call it universal movement of the universe or whatever, but it's got to be connected to that. And so it's, it's, it's a good feeling, you know, for, to do that activity. And uh, I'm just thrilled that it's, it's happening. Of course, the, the advent of the internet and YouTube is, is, you know, it's really exploded the things because no longer do you have to live in an area where you, there's a yo-yo club and there are people to, to, to learn from because they, they learn anything they want to from, from the internet. It's just, you know, it's fabulous. Are, I've, I've seen some of these kids, yourself included, do things that have just totally blown me away. I enjoy watching these new players because I don't believe what I see. They, they're just that good. It's amazing. Where can they go from here? You know, I don't know.
I'm so thrilled that Duncan has got guys, you know, demonstrators going around. I mean, what a great deal because wouldn't that have been a bummer if that had just been, you know, a flash in the pan thing back in the day. The current Duncan crew is over 60 players strong worldwide. And even though we're all very active locally in our yo-yo scene, there are still a few of us that hit the road for that old fashioned tour. We have the Duncan van, we have Duncan crew. We're gonna be teaching people to yo-yo. We're gonna be teaching people how to do the basic 10 tricks. We're gonna be getting them excited about it. The Heritage Tour really falls back on Duncan's 80 plus years of, of history. You know, since our beginnings, we've had demonstrators traveling the country from city to city, promoting yo-yo play, teaching kids how to yo-yo, and then leading up to something bigger at the end of the week, such as a contest. And those contests crowned local champions, and those champions actually are very proud of what they've won and what they've achieved as a yo-yo player. And you'll hear grandparents and parents bragging to their kids and to their friends that they were once the local Duncan Yo-Yo champion in their area. And uh, when I was 14 years old, they had a contest in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, Yo-yos were quite popular in those days. And my buddy, he won a, bike, a bicycle that day, but, but uh, they ran out of bikes, so I didn't get a bike, but you know. And one of the best things about being on tour with other demonstrators is that when they're performing, you get to watch them. And for me, it hasn't lost its magic. It's still mesmerizing to me. But I, some of these kids are doing two at once nowadays. I just saw that on TV a couple weeks ago. I said, Scott, you guys are fantastic. All the guys on the Duncan crew have been really, really good with the uh, the kids that I see on the tour, and not just the kids, the adults too. They spend a lot of time teaching and instructing and, and really making sure that the people that are here to see the tour are, are taking something away from the tour. It's different than a lot of other yo-yo companies, you know, you see them out there just trying to compete to win or, uh, or get titles or get name recognition. But uh, the guys with Duncan really, really help out the community by teaching tricks, spending as much time as necessary uh, with, the, with the kids and adults that want to learn tricks, and really uh, build a, a base in each city that they visit. One of the most rewarding parts about touring is teaching people. I mean teaching people from people who have never picked up a yo-yo to a, some of the players that come in who are competitive players and we just sort of you know riff off each other and learn from each other. A, a lot of these kids will actually come back the next time you, you come through town just to show you how much better they've gotten because you know you were the guy last year that sparked their interest in the first place. And uh, they really encouraged us to get together as a, as a group of yo-yoers. So immediately after that uh, I founded the Kansas City Yo-Yo Club and uh, we've been meeting ever since. It's really, really uh, taking off uh, thanks to the Duncan tour that came in. Why don't you show them a few simple little tricks and then they can kind of, then, then I guess you get hooked. It's all different times. There's no way you can really compare it except the addiction I think is still the same on yo-yos. And so when you learn that first trick, it, was, it, it becomes a progression of, I want to get to the next trick, I want to get to the next trick, I want to get to the next trick. It's, it's something about, in human nature, when you're trying this trick, you're trying to, to do it, you can't get it, you can't get it, and all of a sudden you throw it and it goes perfect. And it's that little endorphin release, and you get addicted to it. I'm really fortunate that that yo has got to be 50, 60 years old, that it hasn't broken yet. But, uh, Still, as far as like wooden yo-yo tricks goes, these guys are at the top of the game. Like some of the tricks that Bud Lutz was doing, uh, the old Barney Acres tricks, were all still pretty impressive, especially on the old wooden yo-yos. It was it was really fun to hang out with those guys and using the using the yo-yos that they used back then. And I got to do Quijibo on it, so it was a really good playing old wooden yo-yo. It is one of the only true multi-generational toys that are out there. 
whether it's your, your dad, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, they all were exposed to the yo-yos. They all played the yo-yos. Because you'll have moms, dads, kids, grandparents. I mean, they've, they've all played with the yo-yo. So it's, it's one of the coolest things to see everybody coming together over such a simple toy. And also there's just some, some kids that were really cool to hang out with and had some pretty cool tricks of their own. The old guys, their, their motto was to build a base or a foundation of yo-yoing, and that's what we're trying to do with these 10 basic tricks. And here are the 10 basic tricks that anyone can do. The spinner, walking the dog, the creeper, around the corner, skin the cat, rocking the baby, sleeping beauty, three-leaf clover, loop-to-loop, -loop, and man on the flying trapeze. And all these tricks are fundamental tricks to yo-yoing, and they're the the tricks that everybody remembers, like Rock the Baby and Around the World, and it's tricks that people are going to ask you if they ever see you with the yo-yo, are going to ask you about Around the World and Walk the Dog. And then at the contest, if it happens to where two people tie, those two contestants then will have to do what's called a loop-off. When a tie occurs, the remaining contestants compete against each other and loop the loop as many times as they can until the tie is broken. We have two competitors who are tied, and so now we're gonna have a loop off for a tiebreaker. Okay. I'm pretty excited about this. One, two, three, go. Luck, Wisconsin is actually considered the yo-yo capital of the world because during Duncan's busiest peaks, when they were manufacturing their wooden products, they were actually made in Luck, Wisconsin at their plant. At the contest that we held in Luck, I don't think a lot of those kids had ever picked up a yo-yo before. And within a few hours, they, we ran the contest and they did pretty well. I did it! And the girl that actually won, she totally picked it up. But she didn't expect to win, and when she got that bike, she was like so stoked. It was one of the coolest moments on tour for me. Uh, it was the only contest where a girl did win, and she was just so excited that she won this bike, and she didn't think she was going to win. No, it was really cool to see her that happy. While on tour, we definitely found ways to keep yo-yoing fun. Uh, whether it was doing silly tricks, or doing old tricks in a new style, or just trying to yo-yo in the van. I wouldn't like to see yo-yos get super competitive. I like to see yo-yos stay as a fun toy and more of a create, creative outlet. And one of the, uh, the styles that we really pioneered was something we like to call bro tricks. Uh, doing the, uh, the bro tricks with Hank was a lot of fun. I think people at the demo kind of received them well because you know, we were doing some pretty cool, hard-looking tricks and then being able to show that it's something silly that you can do with your friends and have a good time is something important for kids to realize. And I mean, it is genuinely kind of a fun challenge to figure out a two-man yo-yo trick.
<laughs> I didn't you think that would work. That. I like to throw a little spin top in there because spin tops have been around throughout the 50s and 60s. Actually, in the 50s and 60s, they were huge. And at the time, Duncan actually had a whole set of spin top demonstrators going around running the same contest as the yo-yo guys. But just like the yo-yos today, technology has brought spin top play to another level. In the 60s, there were actually several national yo-yo contests that were held in Disneyland, California. So when we had the opportunity to do demos at Disney World in Orlando, it was real reminiscent of that period and it was just awesome. Yeah, Disney was great, like uh, <laughs> doing demonstrations for like toy stores and then doing a demonstration at Disney is like two totally different things. With the crowd at Disney, you know, it was great. They would let the little kids get all the way up in the front front of the stage and would stand there and there'd be, you know, 100, 200 kids and like a thousand, I don't know, maybe 2,000 people standing there. It's, it's always sad to see a tour end, but Duncan has been putting together tours for over 80 years, so you know there's gonna be another one. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm super grateful for Duncan for you know, taking me on tour. I think I could pretty easily say it was some of the best time of my life. Yeah, I enjoyed when I was out demonstrating to the kids and talking to the people, and I've had just a wonderful, wonderful life so far, and. I'm anticipating at least another 20. I contribute my success in the manufacturing business and the real world to the experiences I got with Duncan. So it, it uh, was an amazing, you know, it's been an amazing trip you know, with yo -yos. I can't imagine my life, how my life would have, would have come out. When I look back at what I've done as a demonstrator, it's pretty amazing, but when I step even further back and I look at what I'm a part of, it's pretty unreal. Sad.
and I, I the yo-yo has been great for me. Uh, never, never regret. The, I just can't imagine what my life would be without it. So just too many, too many good, good things have happened. To experience the things that our demonstrators have experienced for over 80 years, it, it's, it's a dream come true. It's really an awesome feeling, and I'll get to tell my, my grandkids that I was at one point a Duncan yo-yo professional, which is not a lot of people get to say it. I think it's a pretty proud group to be a part of, and I'm happy I'm on it. Can you, can you go back and be a demonstrator at the age of 67? There's a good question for you. <laughs> be the token old guy off to the side. <laughs> it's obviously when you get uh, a, a history of 80-year uh, history of a company, you are going to have some ups and downs, pardon the pun, but I mean it's really, the, the history of Duncan is really an incredible history, how, how dominant it has been and how dominant it still remains. So uh, they, they still produce uh, uh, good quality products, they still got name brand recognition now and uh, it's a phenomenal company. So. And, and yes, they are vital to uh, uh, keeping the yo-yo movement going. And, uh, you know, I, I'm glad to see them uh, promoting contests like you guys are doing now and, and uh, going around and showing because every new generation needs to see the yo-yo or it'll be lost. I'm trying to trying to think of what to say and also my face is itchy. <laughs> Many of the experiences that I've had the, the privilege of experiencing experiences. Uh. <laughs> Keep a clean string. Makes my skin crawl to go out with a bunch of kids that have yo-yos and that, hey, it worked mine. And you look at this, ooh, <laughs> I gotta put this on my finger. I mean, they're nasty. Duncan is a the, very, the finest yo-yo was ever made, and, uh, and I'm not getting paid to say that. <laughs> Here we are, stop one of the Duncan Harris to yeah, la la la. So are we done? Uh, okay.